Brian Goffman. Welcome, Brian. How you doing? Doing well. How are you, Tom? I'm good. I'm good. Nothing like talking about product management on a weekend morning, right? <laughs> I, this is my favorite subject, so I'll talk about it any day of the week. So for uh, for people who, who aren't familiar with you, why don't we start with uh, the introduction? Who's Brian Goffman? It sounds great. So uh, I'll start with the professional side. I, I'm currently at McKinsey where, uh, and some people may not realize this, but actually we have a whole practice around software, what we call software excellence. And a lot of that focuses on product management. So I've helped create this new group. Um, we worked across a bunch of industries from you know core software, which is really where it all started, but also with auto companies, manufacturing companies, a lot of banks and financial services and fintech, and uh, you know the usual suspects you would think of, just like you see disruption in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. you know you see McKinsey going into all these different sectors. Um, now I'm coming at this. I've been at McKinsey now, uh, going on five years uh, for my second tour of duty. The first one was right out of college as a business analyst. And I spent the interim period in tech roles. I've been um, a venture capitalist uh, back at Austin Ventures. I was also at Microsoft, where I was a product leader in um, the early days of what's now Teams or you know Office 365 with the, one of the first SaaS businesses at Microsoft. And then I also was CEO and co-founder of a company called Optify, which eventually was acquired by Marketo and then Adobe. Um, and at LinkedIn, where I was a VP during the really fast growth period. So uh, I could talk more about any of those things, plus, uh, you know, other other experiences along the way. But a lot of that informs what, you know, what I'm doing today. What a great background. Um, you know, when you talk about some of those are iconic companies now, like Microsoft and, and LinkedIn. Um, I'm curious, like, did you notice different approaches to product excellence uh, at those various kind of companies or or did you feel like you know they're they're actually more similar than they were different well i think there's um hey, look every company in software has similarities in you know focusing on the customer and some like truisms of of mm -hmm. what they'll say they do i think the way those manifest can be really different depending on the company and certainly i think especially as an entrepreneur or in a founder-led company a lot of it comes from the founding team and the and if the founder is still the CEO or still there, you know, it continues on and that looms really large in the way the company looks at the world. So if I take, you know, two contrasts, you know, at um, LinkedIn, we were always very member first. So member mm -hmm. is a free, is one of the people on, you know, like you or me using, yeah. using LinkedIn. And we would always ground our decisions in member first. And there's lots of values at LinkedIn, but anyone could tell you member first. They would mm. be able to say that right away. And that would show up in decisions around product prioritization. It would show up in decisions around, you know, should we continue this initiative or not? Um, should we expand in this country or not? You know, basic decisions about the growth of the company, um, even to the point of like in the early days of what's now sales solutions, which is a business, which is a billion dollar business. Um, we weren't sure we wanted to launch it because we didn't know if LinkedIn pe members would want to hear from salespeople. We mm -hmm. thought it could be spammy and there was a lot of controversy over that. Now it's a given, but there were a lot of way bumps along the way around member first. I think, you know, if you look at um, Microsoft, when I was there, um, we gave out what we called ship it awards, which were plaques you got with mm -hmm. little stickers on them when it was yeah. a new product got shipped. Yeah. And that was really what, PMs and product teams, what we call at that time, business groups were rewarded for was shipping. Yeah. And, and as soon as something shipped, then everybody would reorg and move into a different team. And, you know, because that was like, Ooh, okay, we got office out, you know, <laughs> windows done. We got this done, but that's not, that's not a SaaS company. That's not, you know, uh, the world we live in today. So Microsoft has fundamentally changed in, in that way. But, you know, I think those kind of things, those sort of ways of looking at the world, show up in the behaviors and what you get rewarded for. And what do you think uh, when you look at companies that are building great, great software products today, what do you think they're rewarding these days? Like how do they, they measure success and encourage the right behaviors? Well, I think uh, especially in the SaaS, you know, B2B SaaS world, most companies that are successful or all, I'd say all companies that are successful have gotten religion 
on being customer focused and using data to drive decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, data doesn't drive your first version of product market fit. You know, if you're two guys with a PowerPoint or a, a demo, you intuitively know what's working. But once you get something going, once you have traction, then the uh, the data starts to drive the decision making, and it becomes a game of much more optimization. Uh, and so I think that's something that is pretty standard across the board. And then, and a lot of that also comes from the consumer world. And what was interesting about like, if you take a LinkedIn or, um, or, or, or many companies like Google, where you've got both business products and consumer products, that consumer um, way of looking at the world and running and leading products tends to bleed over into the business products. And so they tend to be more based on, you know, input from seeing the way consumers or users behave. Um, I think the other thing that's universal is the rise of what you could call product marketing and the role of that kind of a team where they're gathering quantitative or sorry, qualitative and quantitative feedback that doesn't maybe come from directly looking at product feedback, but they can look a little further out. Um, some companies call that product strategy, you know, but it's an adjunct to product management. And so there's a whole portfolio of roles around the product manager who are making the product successful. And I think that's another piece that's kind of evolved in, in, in software. Um, the one last thing I'll say about this is that um, a lot of companies outside of software are trying to look at Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, the, you know, the leaders mm -hmm. and say, how can we be like that? Because they're getting their clocks cleaned in a lot of cases, or they're seeing disruption that they've got to increase the pace that they can innovate. And a lot of the innovation is happening in software. Um, and, and so you're seeing a change in the operating model in a lot of those companies to look more like a tech company. Yeah. I'd love to double click on that a little bit as someone who has worked at a couple of big tech companies. I mean, I'm the first to say, you know, we might, people may think that these big companies are well-oiled machines and <laughs> we have some magic formula, but it's a little, you know, some, not quite that, not quite like that. And I'm curious, um, what have you observed when you see non-traditional tech companies trying to embrace what they think is how big tech works? And, and does that work? Because uh, I guess part of me f feels like, well, it's not one thing. It's, it's a combination of things that, that help produce these, these kind of outsized results and, and they're not easily kind of transferable. Um, you know, not, you know, it's just sometimes it's right time, right industry, right kind of problem, you know, all that kind of thing. How have you, yeah. how, how have you seen that? Yeah. Um, so first of all, the, you know, the broader thing you're talking about is change management. If you're, if you're here and you want to go there, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to paint an extreme picture of where the change is going to potentially happen in order to get to the middle. And so part of what a lot, a lot of these companies are so far off of the model of the Google. And I know there's issues at every company, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, we certainly mm -hmm. had our share of problems, but the velocity is so much higher than it is in a lot of these other places um, that it, the, the, they have to say, okay, well, let's see how all these other guys do it. Cause we think we want to be more like them, but then they look at the reality and they say, okay, well, we can't go all the way there. Maybe we can go somewhere in between. And, one big challenge in a lot of companies that are not tech companies is they're not tech led. You know, mm -hmm. they're still at the extreme. They have business people who are running the show and then they consider IT sort of that, you know, 80s, 90s version of IT in the back room, mm -hmm. getting orders from the business people about what to build. Right. And that's a huge and, you know, from Google, I mean, that's not the way tech companies run. The mm -hmm. engineers and the product managers are in charge in some form. And they're setting the roadmap and that and i think that also relates to what i think of as the role of pm it's sort of the ceo of the product i know that's been debated quite a bit but the idea that the product manager is leading the charge is not the way most companies work the product manager is taking orders from some set of business people who are making the strategic and business decisions and goals and going and executing against a roadmap um, and that's a, and if you go to the very, very extreme, you have something like the federal government or, um, you know, the defense department or places like that, where, you know, then you've got really people ma mainly managing to a budget and that's how they're rewarded. 
Mm-hmm. So there's this whole spectrum of, of uh, you know, ways people are measured and who's in charge. And it's, it's very different as you get out of tech um, and see the way those things work. Yeah, it, it reminds me of um, many years ago when I when I left um, Google the first time and I um, joined a actually a small cap uh, tech company, publicly traded um, ad tech company. And I think they they hired me partly because they were like, oh, well, you've you've seen how Google does it. Like we want you to bring some of that magic, you know, into mm-hmm. our company and you know, it became very clear uh, upon reflection now um, that, you know, it's sort of like a city like in the, I don't know, like in Ames, Iowa saying, oh, we want to bring some Silicon Valley people and like turn turn Ames into the next Silicon Valley. Like it's hard. Like you you can't just bring some people in. The, the kind of conditions on the ground are fundamentally different. And in that example... The company I went to, like it was a small publicly traded company. It was very much dependent on delivering like, uh, you know, quarterly financial outcomes. And so when I would come in with, let's say, a big tech perspective of like, let's play the long game, let's test and learn, let's make some mistakes, let's iterate fast. And I'm going to take resources away from things that would drive, you know, short term revenue impact. Uh that's not a that's not a rational call for for that type of enterprise because mm-hmm. they're like, well, mm-hmm. we don't have th- this core business that you used to have. And so and so I, I wonder, do you ever see like how do you help companies um, manage expectations who say, you know, you probably get these enthusiastic CEOs that are like, oh, we want to be more like, you know, Amazon or whatever. But they're not. You know, that's a very unique business. Yeah. Well, you see it in especially like you were reminding me in industries where their margins are lower Mm -hmm. so we take it for granted when we're in tech that we have SaaS margins of 80 percent or microsoft where we had you know essentially we could run the company and off the cash on the balance sheet for years you know with no new products so i think that software that's part of what makes software such a great business which is why i love it so much um among you know and 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 internet companies i think are in the same boat i think when you go into hardware Mm. you see that while gross margins are much lower there's a lot less room to spend and a lot of these companies are differentiating themselves on software but the consumer is not necessarily willing to pay more so you know Mm -hmm. if you take two samsung tvs and one has smart features and has a cloud back end and all kinds of capabilities and the other one doesn't it's unclear that a consumer is willing to pay a whole lot more for that extra smart feature, but it's a given now because the market has, requires it. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, these added services have only become additional cost for the hardware companies and push their margins down even more. And they've created support burdens and yeah. lots of other challenges. Um, so if you compare, I don't know, you know, Sonos, which I really admire, is doing incredible things with the software. You basically buy that speaker and now you've got potentially 10 years of additional capabilities coming to you through their app, which you don't pay for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and now you're going to buy more speakers and they know that, you know, they get you into a family of speakers and they've been really gaining share. But uh, the other, you know, but they, they're not getting paid. You're not paying them a monthly fee for that. So that's where the challenges come in, I think. And, and the third part of that is, You've got companies like Google, Amazon, and I'm just talking about the speaker market uh, that are essentially giving, almost giving away their speakers. They're losing money on their speakers because they have a different additional strategic goals of being in your home, you know, having a voice assistant, Mm -hmm. um, controlling your living room, which was something we talked about at Microsoft when I was there in with the Xbox. Uh, So that's why being, as you mentioned, a a small company in a niche market with low margins Mm -hmm. trying to innovate is pretty tough. It's hard to work your way out of that, that box. If you're competing with other companies that are willing to either lose money or have very different strategic goals than yours. And, and, and that's why you see the market kind of play out the way it does in a way. Now, Brian, when you and I I last talked um, off the show, uh, you had mentioned that there was some research that 
you participated in or or McKinsey published that you thought uh, was generating a lot of interest. So I'm curious if you could share, you know, some of the insights or some of the things that you all are learning and that are that's driving kind of thought provoking conversation when it comes to product excellence out there. Yeah, one of the things we did was we did some research with actually with Microsoft where we looked at developer velocity. So mm. what what creates in a, it, it broadly based innovation and we correlated it to a bunch of different factors around business outcomes. So we didn't mm -hmm. just say dead velocity like how many check-ins or you know codes lines written mm -hmm. or anything like that because those aren't really meaningful but more business outcomes but then we also looked at well what was creating the dev velocity underneath that and there were four main factors um one main factor was um the adoption of agile which kind of makes sense mm -hmm. but what was interesting was agile at a really high level of adoption versus medium level didn't make that much difference so mm -hmm. And, and this is where I think it makes sense in the market. A lot of companies are saying, okay, we're agile enough. We don't have to be awesome at agile because that's not actually creating incremental value relative to the, what it takes to standardize everything and bring everybody along. Um, another factor was just, you know, engineering tooling and DevOps. This again, makes sense, but the faster you can get your engineers to be productive, the better, the more productive they're going to be. Um, and another factor was what we called, uh, a, you know, a, a culture of safety or where you could fail. And that mm. was a, another you know, kind of view of what the culture allowed. And this makes sense in a tech company, but in a lot of companies, you know, failure is not really an option and you have to plan, 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 plan. And that slows things down. And then the last factor was uh, the role of product management and companies where you see product managers operating more as leaders of, of initiatives and being this kind of almost general management kind of role, they have a much higher velocity. And some, I, one of my friends at Facebook said to me, you know, well, we have these engineers who are really incredible. They can actually decide what to build. Why do we even have PMs? And he said, well, we have them because it helps at, at the margin. It helps us build the right things. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that's also true. And you see that in the outcomes in the research. So, I, I mean, anybody who wants can, can, there's some articles on this that we published, but the, um, the, the product management part is the, is one of the things that's really resonated with a lot of companies. Yeah. So are you seeing some of the companies that you've worked with, um, standing up kind of stronger product management organizations and, and culture? And like, I'm curious, what, what is it like, um, trying to, to build a, a PM kind of practice. Uh, at, well, at I mean, what's, mean. what's interesting is, so I just, we just finished doing some work with what you would say is it absolutely leading tech company, you know, huge, mm -hmm. large market cap software company. It's been around for quite a long time. And we are working with them on improving the talent base they have. They, they have, they don't want to have to just go out and replace the people. They have a commitment to bringing the people that they have into the right level. And one of the things they were also struggling with was the role of product managers, technical program managers, program managers, like all these different people in the mix. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that had happened was program managers were not particularly technical and were ending up just tracking lots of things, mm. which was not a very empowered role. And they wanted to fundamentally change that. They had product managers. They wanted to work across their different products because products have become very siloed. So that had to change the model. So it, I guess one thing I'm finding is even in the leading companies where you say these guys are just crushing it, mm -hmm. they're doing so well, they're still raising the bar because they're not achieving their strategic goals. And, and, the, and the, one of the best ways to, to fix that is to empower your product managers and get them, you know, really and trained and in the, going in the right direction. Yeah, you know, we've talked about uh, just in this early conversation, program managers, product marketers, product managers, mm -hmm. and, you know, depending on the company and even within the company, the team, those roles kind of start overlapping. Mm -hmm. And do you think like um, that, that those are the right, it's right to kind of separate them? Or do you think there's other ways to slice and dice? Like how, how have you seen this kind of pan out? And when you look at other companies? 
Well, I think like a lot of things, the answer is it depends. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a 10 person startup, you shouldn't have all those roles. It doesn't make sense because you don't need to work mm -hmm. across programs uh, and, and products and, you know, um, and, and you don't have the engineering mm -hmm. complexity. I think the other, so stage matters. And the other thing that matters is what business are you in? Are you hardware, software, some hard, you know, hard, hybrid? Um, and so I guess the, if, if you're a hardware company, even early on, you need a program management function typically because you've got manufacturing, supply chain, lots of other things. I saw this at Smart Things where I was, you know, which was part of Samsung. Um, and that brought in a whole lot of complexity I had never seen. Because when you launch a hardware product, if you have a defect, you have to recall, you know, you physically recall. You don't just take up and down your your, your software launch. Mm. Um, so that's, that's definitely a, a role that's important. I think it a lot of times program management gets bigger in software companies when they've when they haven't addressed the fundamentals, there's sort of, and, and no offense to any program managers out there, just more that it's a little bit of a band aid a lot of times of things aren't working that well. So let's put on some more tracking and mm -hmm. calculating around what is happening. Um, and so, usually, one of the things that happens is you move more, some of those program managers become product managers and become empowered as opposed to, um, you know, tracking programs and, and, or you change the role of the program manager so they have more authority to make decisions. And then product marketing, if I take the LinkedIn example, I think we had a really good good way that product management and product marketing work together. Um, product marketing was more in the long-term qualitative and also communication role out to customers. And that was across the consumer products and the business products. And the product managers were more embedded with engineering mm -hmm. and were making day-to-day -day decisions. I mean, I'm not saying they weren't strategic, but they were much closer to feature prioritization and, and roadmaps than the, than the product marketing teams were. So if we were doing something that was really transformational, like an acquisition that would change the business model in some way, or, um, you know, do something fundamentally different, usually product management, sorry, product marketing would have a bigger role. And, and then, but obviously everybody, including engineering and product management and the entire business development, everybody would be coming along, but product management marketing played a big role in a lot of those cases. Yeah. It's so interesting. I remember when I was at Microsoft, I always felt like the product marketers were a little bit more downstream. Um, like after we we have the stuff ready to go. They would find a way to go and communicate and take it to market. But I think you're talking about a, a much more proactive, forward-looking product marketing approach. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's that's true. And I think Microsoft has gone back and forth on this. Yeah, quite a lot. Um, probably, I don't know your exact timing, but Microsoft used to call product managers program managers, which mm -hmm. was just as confusing. Now they're called product managers. Um, and then they had product marketing sitting in the business group with the product teams. Yeah. They've reorganized now, from what I understand, product marketing reports into marketing. And I think that is more, more closely aligned to the role you just described. It, and, and that's more the type of model where the product marketing team is taking what product is building and is more in a communicating role out to sales and, um, and, and less influential in the roadmap and in transformational type uh, changes. Now, I think I may have found this, uh, at least one of the articles that you were alluding to on the McKinsey website. Let me kind of share one of the visuals here. Um, this thing is about developer velocity and innovation. Is this the one? Yeah, of the, that's, that, yeah. that's one of the articles. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about developer velocity. Um, why do you think it's so hard for some companies to to have higher development velocity? And I kind of feel bad for like the hardware companies because like there's it feels like there's only so much they can do because to your point, like, you know, they, they have um, much higher error costs and, you know, much longer lead times. Mm -hmm. But yeah, share a little bit about your thoughts on on dev velocity and, and its impact. Well, this this really gets to kind of these are these on the left there. You've got the four main outcomes: innovation, mm -hmm. customer satisfaction, 
brand perception and talent management. Um, and then you've got this graph which shows velocity versus innovation. So it kind of makes sense. The higher velocity you have, the more innovative you are. Mm -hmm. And it's not exactly aligned, but it's pretty closely correlated in this in the index. And then what I mentioned before were the main inputs to what causes dev velocity, which then of course leads to innovation. So, you know, broadly speaking, it's very tough for companies to hire talent right now, especially, mm -hmm. I mean, even restaurants can't hire the people they want, much less the tech companies. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if you, Google's struggling to get all the engineers that Google wants, imagine what it's like for tier five, tier six, you know, company trying to, tr trying to add software where software is not its core. It's mm -hmm. you know, still in that kind of it mode. And that's a huge factor. And uh, it, it, it doesn't mean they can't hire anybody. Um, but they, they struggle quite a bit. And so, and just, I really believe in that mythical man month. I mean, having more engineers doesn't necessarily create faster velocity if yeah. the engineers aren't equal and they aren't equal. So, so that's another, that's a big, big factor, especially right now with the market, the way it is. And I don't see that changing in the short term. Um, the, the other, uh, but the culture matters a lot too, because you know, companies are eight, some companies are able to hire great people, but if they have the wrong culture and they don't empower those people and they don't give them the right tools, then those people, even if they're great, won't be successful. So they also have to have to create the right environment. Yeah. You know, on that chart, the, the talent kind of retention or talent management, the impact of improving velocity on that is, um, definitely maybe some people don't think about, they, they might think about, oh, improve velocity. You can iterate faster and find market fit faster, but people want to work in companies where, and teams where they can see the results, you know, move quickly. And, mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and, and, uh, um, I'm curious, how do you, what advice would you give a client or, uh, a company that, you know, they can't go as fast as let's say a Facebook could for their consumer stuff because they're working on hardware. They're working on heavy, you know, regulated stuff or, you know, stuff where the security or safety or anything is, is like a very high bar. Mm -hmm. How do they, how, how have you seen companies kind of squeeze out as much velocity as they can when they're not working on some, you know, social media thing that, you know, it doesn't matter if there's a bug here or there. Well, I, so one of the counterintuitive things about software is that not changing it is actually worse than more frequent releases. So some, if you take some banks or government mm. institutions, they've got this, and I haven't worked very much with these kind of mm -hmm. organizations, but they have an, uh, an attitude that, well, if we don't, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. And that is a losing strategy because the hackers are moving on. Everybody's finding vulnerabilities in what you've got today. And so you see some of these companies that say only do a release on Saturday nights because they need to know that Sunday and their engineers are working every weekend of the year or whenever they do a release. And if, you're, if you've been in a SaaS company, you go, well, that's, that's horrible from a lifestyle perspective, mm -hmm. but it's also not a good, it's very old school as far as release frequency, but in their, in their way of looking at the world, that's the safest way to do it. Don't release very often. And when you do release, do it on a Saturday night when nobody's looking. And then, you know, Sunday you can test everything and mm -hmm. you do a lot of, you know, months and months of testing in advance. And, uh, that, that model, um, is, uh, is generally a failing model and you see actually higher rates of of security breaches in those sort of environments than you see in the ones where they have more frequent releases. The other, the other thing that's interesting is, um, uh, well, when you get to hardware companies, the issue is a little different, which is a lot of hardware companies think of the, uh, the budgeting and the product cycle as when they imagine the product to when they ship the product. So the day it ships to Best Buy, the product's done. Mm. Or, you know, the day the TV is finished and shown at CES and retailers have bought it, shows up on the shelf, finished. But that's not actually the way a consumer thinks about it. Yeah. Especially now where you've got products like Sonos, which have an ongoing relationship with you. You've got an app and you're using it all the time and controlling your product with it. So they have to fundamentally change the way they even budget 
and the reach and allocate resources to things that arguably aren't generating new revenue because they've already been sold. So that's a huge change. And, you know, if you, I, I have a enormous admiration for Tesla. I mean, I think they've, they've changed the concept of a car. The car companies still work the same way where they ship the car and they don't really think, Oh, we have to upgrade the car. Once you bought yeah. it, they think if you want upgrades, go buy a new car. But Tesla is saying, no, you, you, we sold you this car. You're going to get, here's some new things that are coming and make your car better. And of course they want to charge for a lot of those things. Now that's part of their model. Yeah. But people are, would rather pay a little bit more monthly to get a new feature in their car than go buy a new car because there's nothing wrong with the car. It's just the software. That is so true. I, I remember in the eighties and and nineties, there was this great kind of tra transformation from that was led by like Toyota, Honda, where they would come out with major car updates every three to five years compared to like, let's say GM or Chrysler or stuff that, you know, might have a seven year cycle. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. we're getting to a place where you expect your car to get a little better every day, you know, through last night's over the way, over the air update. It's, it's just amazing how, how much we've, um, you know, kind of changed over time and yeah, I agree with yeah. you. Tesla's definitely. Yeah. Kudos and, and, and it's not like that wasn't true before, you know, windows, you didn't have to buy a new PC to get a new version of windows. Mm -hmm. Windows got better. Now your phone gets better every, it's a kind of annoying sometimes. How many times <laughs> that whole releases new operating system updates. And sometimes it's just security updates, but that right. those updates are evolving your phone. And so the yeah. phone you bought, is not the phone you have today because it's got all these new capabilities. That's the way that the world has become accustomed to, uh, you know, consumers have become accustomed to buying. Now, when we think about that from a product management lens, if you are coming from a world where you had these, like, let's just call it major releases and you'd, you'd, you know, uh, you've gone from the ship it, kind of world to the just continuously updating world how do you think that makes the pm's job different or what what do you are, are there different kinds of spikes and capabilities that a modern pm needs now that maybe they didn't need five or ten years ago in, in your view well in this what we call best in class continuous innovation world mm -hmm. um there's a number of things that pms need to have and this is this gets into you know what is a great product manager and right uh one of the guys i worked with in the past he said the number one characteristic is knowing what to work on which i admit is probably one of the toughest things because things are coming at you from every direction and just knowing how to prioritize and you know get get the noise get through the noise is is mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, factors but as far as like things you can test um one is understanding the customer and really being able to have the tools to continuously understand the customer, to be able to look at the data, look at the qualitative information, do the interviews, know how to get all these different kinds of inputs and mm -hmm. make sense of it is one of the big, you know, one major thing with customer, with uh, PMs and a lot of PMs, they get sucked so much into the sprint and the, you know, the engineering planning, mm -hmm. they lose that customer view or at some companies, there's so many, different um, layers between them and the customer. And this used to be mm -hmm. the case at Microsoft. They didn't know what the customer was. They, their customer was the sales team, mm. but that's not the customer. The customer is the customer, not, not the marketing team or the sales team or somebody in between you and the customer. Um, I think the other one is, uh, you know, a certain amount of uh, technical skill, depending on what products you're working on. Certainly if you're working at Google cloud or, mm -hmm. um, or, or AWS, in technical products, you have to have that technical capability or you're not going to be credible with the engineering team. If you're in a place like more of a consumer company, you know, there you got to understand your, your customer. So you, I, I don't think it's an age thing, but I certainly think it's a mentality. You have to be able to imagine those next things that, that a teenager might want. If that's, if that's your customer, even if you're not a teenager, um, the, there's a soft skills component to it. You know, PMs typically, don't have big teams, but they have a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. And so they have to be able to work across teams, set a vision, take quality notes, just run process. And, and then, you know, 
there's an element of um, kind of business knowledge, depending on, again, the product and what they're managing. But ideally, you know, and I think this is why you see a lot of people wanting to go into product management, because it's the closest thing to being a general manager in most tech companies. You have to be able to look at the market, understand the, con the consumer, um, think about the long term strategy. And, and so that's th that's a pretty tough bar. Yeah, it's a lot. Of, and, and there's even more. But those are the main things. Yeah, uh, I I thought this uh, this part of the article was a great summary. I think I think you're alluding into it too, as well. These these key dimensions, and you also mentioned Brian that uh, uh, the mini CEO argument. You you said, oh well, I know there's there's different opinions about that. I I might be biased as as a as a PM in my day job, <laughs> but why aren't the PMs the mini CEO? Sh shouldn't they be? Or or do you think uh, have you What's your what's your view and what have you heard in terms of the pros and cons of that approach? Well, so I I like I like it, I'll say personally. Right. I would say <laughs> the reason it's controversial is there are a lot of people who've written blogs and other posts or discussed the idea that, you know, generally the product manager is looking at top line growth and not costs. Mm. So a CEO has to balance all of these things. They're looking right. at it. Uh, you know, the entire P and L and that's the CEO CEO. And also they're looking cross functionally and they have to worry about all the impacts across all the functions. So is the product manager a CEO? No, from that, in that perspective, mm -hmm, they are mm -hmm. not, um, are they the CEO of their product? You could argue. Yes. Um, especially in places where they are worried about P and L like in a hardware company, a lot of times they do have to worry about the cost structure and the bomb, um, and, uh, and and what else is going into their product. So I think there are cases where they are, but the the reason it's controversial is this whole element of like, no, they're not really CEOs and they shouldn't get too far ahead of themselves. Um, but I do think it's great training and you see that, you know, certainly, I mean, Sundar was a, was a, a product manager. Yeah. Um, a lot of, a lot of CEOs in tech have come out of product management. I think that's another sort of sidebar question is what the career path is. And I'll just say, and I haven't done this analysis, but yeah, anecdotally, I would say my peers in product management or bec who become eventually become chief product officers, right? More, and I think that's in, not because they're not capable, but I think it's because they like building products, and they're more interested in being a chief product officer than being a CEO. Yeah, you uh, your audio broke up there for a second, but I think you were saying, Brian, that people who rise to the highest levels of product often don't become CEO; that they stay as as CPO. Is that was yeah? That sorry, what uh, yeah, exactly. I I've yeah. seen they, and I think that's a choice. I don't think that's a question of would they would someone hire them to be a CEO. I think they like building products. Yeah, and that's back to the CEO question of you know. If you really love building products and you become a CEO, all of a sudden you've got to deal with all this other stuff yeah, yeah. that's not related to products, you know, and and so you kind of maybe product is 20 percent of your time, even if it's in an early stage startup like with me, you know, it might be 80 percent of your time. But it was still you were worried about, you know, talent, fundraising, yeah. uh, uh, benefits, like all kinds of things that are very mundane, especially in a startup that have nothing to do with building products. Yeah, there's definitely a little time with fundraising when you're the CEO of a startup. <laughs> That's right. You know yourself. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. it'll it'll occupy a good amount of your time. Um, you know, related topic. Uh, I've noticed there's a little bit more now um, where you've got these GM roles, these general manager roles um, for for kind of product units. And at Microsoft, uh, when I was there in the early 2000s that we had these pums like product unit manager kind of thing and i'm curious like have you noticed um that career path because traditionally lots of tech companies the product management function really doesn't connect with the other functions at, at, until the very highest level um sometimes you see these gm opportunities pop up but it's it's not common uh, mm -hmm. any thoughts on that like having product engine design like only meet sometimes at the CEO level. Well, there's the, the, that, that's another common topic when 
if you're able to just look at your operating model and say, well, how, how should we organize? And probably the biggest example of that general management model is Amazon. I mean, Amazon has the single threaded owner PMs or product leaders generally are almost, or they are general managers in a lot of cases with direct reporting to them. Yeah. And that's the way AWS is mostly structured. A lot of them, not everything at Amazon is done that way, but that's the two pizza team. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no more, no more people on the team than you could feed with two pizzas. And then essentially you've got a, a structure. Sorry about the dog in the background there. Um, you've got a structure that's, uh, that's built of two multiple, two pizza teams layering up to, to the top of the company. And, and that works really, really well in the sense that you've got one person who's got accountability for all the different functions. And if she keeps barking, I'll go grab her. But, the, <laughs> the, you know, that that account that solves the accountability problem. Um, what it requires, though, which Amazon does really well, is it requires a planning process where those general managers can meet on an annual basis and then on a regular basis after that. So they make sure that they're building a flywheel as opposed to a bunch of silos. Yeah. And so when that doesn't work is when you have general managers of all these different divisions or different product groups. And they're just working in their own silo and they think of the team as their people they control. And then you end up with, you know, no synergy and no flywheel. Yeah. So that I'm, I've not, um, not had any time working at Amazon. So it, is it that their PMs actually have formal, uh, or their senior PMs or PM leads have formal own ownership or, direct reporting from other functions into them like like ux and engineering yeah i mean i haven't worked uh, full caveat i've haven't yeah. worked at amazon either but i've worked with a lot of amazon people and and yeah looked at the model but the but yeah there's a few things in place they call them mechanisms that allow this to work one is they do have direct line reporting now not everybody reports to that person mm -hmm. necessarily uh, but they have direct line reporting of a lot of functions that at a place like um, google or facebook the pm would not have Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, engineering may or may not report to the PM, but in a bigger team, usually it does report mm -hmm. to the to the PM. Um, it depends on the leader and, and on the business. The, the other thing is they have the ability to kind of loan and borrow resources. So another thing that happens is in places where there's lots of you know, diverging goals at times, you have to have a way to reconcile those goals. And so if you're a PM and I'm a PM and we're peers and I have a dependency on you, in theory, if I have budget, I can give you resources mm. or I can allow you to hire people on my behalf. Right. So you can do things that will allow me to do my release. And we ran into this problem all the time at Microsoft with the this kind of better together situation, you know, the goals. And but we would just wait a lot of times. We would say, well, we can't do our release until office. Right. Releases. And then office is late. So we're late too, but there wasn't any mechanism to solve that problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and it, at Amazon, they have these ways you can borrow and, and loan resources so that you can solve for dependencies. Uh, that's super cool. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely remember, I mean, I remember my time at Microsoft where when you had these cross team dependencies, you could go as fast as the slowest team that you depended on. And, um, it sounds like maybe at Amazon and other places, there's a little bit more, you have this discretionary headcount budget that maybe you can loan or fund another team's efforts to kind of accelerate your, yeah. Your, yeah. your dependency. That's right. And I've also, I don't know if it's true, you could verify, but I, I've heard that at Google, there's also mechanisms where PMs have some sort of slack in their budget and they can allocate across different areas, including on other teams to to achieve goals and yeah and there's some flexibility there but it's definitely in my experience um more informal and definitely more cross-functional collaborative like i i can't unilaterally say okay yeah i'm gonna move these engineers off of this thing on that thing it's it's for sure would require kind of a cross-functional leadership meeting where we talk about that as an option mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and decide. And, and I guess 
whether it's Amazon or not, there's probably some other companies where they there's a little bit more formal empowerment. And I'm guessing, you know, there's pros and cons to that approach as well. I mean, yeah, yeah. The uh, I, I mean, the, the thing that I imagine, like, let's say Facebook doesn't do that Amazon model is a I imagine they have a belief that there's these are different disciplines and they want product management excellence and engineering excellence. And if you have it kind of converging too low in the org, you may not be able to kind of bring out the best uh, in, in those kind of job ladders or those functions, but um, then you end up taking a little bit of a tax around kind wow. of decision-making. Yeah. Again, I think the downside of it is there are many downsides potentially, right? If you go in, like, why would a PM be great at managing a marketing person or a sales yeah, person right. or, you know, but that's, but that is the way things are set up in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, versus having functional organizations and then this kind of matrix way we did like the way we did at LinkedIn or certainly at Microsoft and most Valley companies are set up with a matrix, right? So where you're all going after the same goal and you may have a temporary leader, cross-functional leader, but you're not hard line reporting into that person across multiple functions. Well, Brian, it's been a super cool, uh, weekend, morning conversation with you about product management before we wrap up um what's some advice that you would give to folks that are in the the product world and and trying to to be more effective and help their companies be more successful what what are some kind of uh hmm. suggestions question. Or, or, question. or things that you'd call out for them uh well one is i think you you know it's worth popping your head up and seeing how other companies yeah. and other groups are working because there's a lot of different models out there. A lot of times people know where they came from. So if they came from Apple or Google or Facebook or wherever, you know, they know how that worked and now they're somewhere new and they, but they, it's worth doing reading. And there's, there's actually companies like uh, product school and others where they, I'm sure you're familiar with that are um, helping surface some of these methodologies and ways of working. Cause you can't major in product management, at least not mm -hmm. now. Um, and, and I, and I really believe in it as a discipline. And I think that's something peer people can work in peer groups and, and learn from others, uh, while, you, you know, at, include in their own company and also outside. Um, the second thing is, you know, keeping your skills up to date, this stuff changes all the time, the new techniques, um, the things that you did five years ago, you shouldn't be doing today. And so if you're not continuing to evolve. Uh, so make sure you're personally evolving because when you go to think about your next role, um, you're going to need those skills. And, and then I think the last thing I would think about is um, think about your long term goals. You know, if you're if you're trying to be if you're using PM as a stepping stone to be a CEO, maybe you need to beef up your skills around things, get experiences around things that a CEO does and understand that job. If you're trying to be a chief product officer, that's a different, you know, kind of route. There's a lot of routes you can go out of product. And, and I think thinking about that and articulating it to other people, they can help you on the journey. Love it. I, I noticed we have one question from one of the live viewers, uh, Wes Wu, who says, I have amazing PM friends who are stuck in the non-tech IT comes last industries. They've tried to make the jump over to agile, high, high velocity engineering led world. Um, but have not succeeded any advice or tips. These guys often have five plus years of experience and, and would rock it. Uh, so basically there's potentially this kind of trapped talent in the old, older kind of approach companies, and they're not able to, to make the, the crossover to some of the faster moving places. Why don't you take that first and I'll, I'll share some thoughts after. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's, I sympathize. I am, uh, I can or empathize in some ways, you know, the, those kind of companies, when, if you go to a company that's tech led and you've been in this kind of backseat role and you describe it that way, they're not going to be super excited about you as, an, <laughs> as an, and making that shift because yeah. they're going to see you in that light. And the way tech works is people generally see you for what you're doing today, not what you did five years ago or what you, or, hopefully what you could do, but it's a little harder to imagine. So they tend to see you in this, in the light of what you're doing today. So I think one, the first step would be try to do it in the place where you are. And there's always a chance, I think, to take bigger initiatives. 
And if that fails, then go look outside. Um, this, the, the other piece of it, though, is, um, you know, get involved in um, your own project. So, so to some extent, you can show you can show entrepreneurship outside of work. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think, Tom, you probably know this. If somebody comes in and says, hey, I've got, I've got this project. I'm running, you know, my own side gig mm-hmm. or I've coded this thing. Here's what I did. You can demonstrate your work, even if it's not your day job. And that's painful. Might require some weekends and nights. But showing initiative, I think, is is really, really valued, especially in startups, but also in larger tech companies where they want to see what you can do. So yeah. Two ideas. I, I'll think about it some more, but I want to hear what you, you have to say. Yeah, I totally agree, especially the last part. Like uh, if I'm interviewing someone and they're not from one of the usual suspects, but they say, oh, you know, also like on the weekends, I started this little project and, you know, I built it from scratch and me and my buddy, you know, put this together and um, here's how I thought about it. And here's some things I've learned along the way. Like I I love hearing about that stuff. I think it's super cool. Um, The other thing I would share is Sometimes you do need to either go through the side door or be willing to take a little bit of a, a haircut in some way uh, just to 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 get your you know get into the into the company you want to be at. So as an example, let's say you're in product management at a company that maybe isn't as tech first and you know um, there's an opportunity in program management or, customer support or product specialist or something uh, where you're like, oh, well, I can totally do that, but that's, you know, I can do so much more. If you don't have the opportunity to get the job that you you really want right away, just kind of getting on the team and 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 demonstrating that you can execute really well in that other, in that new environment, uh, and then kind of positioning yourself for a lateral move, I think, makes i've seen it many times <laughs> and uh it, it it works really well because it de-risks it for the company because they're like okay yeah you know joe smith is a product manager at this old school company um, but he has some domain expertise that would be great as a product specialist at our company is trying to break into this new and in, in, into this industry that's new for the for the kind of tech company um and then you end up going there and you're great and you build great relationships with all the pms and eng leads and everything and then a year or two later you talk to your manager about hey can i do a pm rotation or i see this new pm opportunity coming up i want to go for it your your standing would be so much different than coming cold from some company that we're not as familiar with um so that would be the 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 maybe the third piece i would add to your advice yeah, and I, I agree with that. I, I've seen that even in internal moves. Uh, there's yeah. a guy, uh, uh, you know, example of one company I was in. He was a VP in a role he wasn't excited about. He wanted to be in product management. He went down essentially three levels mm-hmm. to be a PM. Um, and he eventually worked his way up back up to VP. But it, it took a while. Yes. But, you know, life is, life is short. And spending years in the thing you don't like is not... <laughs> Is not worth doing. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, then, and I think there are always routes in. It, I mean, not to say that it's not hard, but I think it's, there's a lot of techniques for doing it. Yeah, and even if you know, it does require some patience because some people I've talked to have said, "Hey, if I don't want to be a PM, like, why do I need to prove myself as a PGM or a product specialist or a product marketer or whatever, uh, partner manager?" Um, these kind of like PM adjacent roles. And that's when I say like, look, you don't have to be a PM at, at my company. Like there are, you could, you could be a PM at another company that is more willing to take a leap of faith, especially like earlier stage companies where they probably don't want to have a dedicated headcount for a product manager now. And they need someone that can also be a sales engineer and a customer support person and whatever else and do some marketing. Um, so that's another trade-off that I think people may want to think about, which is like, if you go to one of the, the kind of blue chip tech companies and you want to be a PM, like that's a, you really need to build a strong case and, and you got to be willing to put some time in. Whereas if you go to a more dynamic, more kind of younger, kind of fast changing company, 
um, they're willing to take a chance because they they're going to optimize for talent and you know they don't need the perfect resume for for a PM. I, I think it works the other way too. If you go in as a PM in an early stage company, you're probably guess what? You're also going to be doing sales. You're going to yeah. be customer support. True. My uh, friend of mine is the CEO of a you know startup, very small company. He answers the phone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or the emails for yeah. customers. So it you know so I think it works the other way too, where you if all you want to do is product management. But you don't have the background. You've got to figure out a workaround somewhere. You're going to make a trade off. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, Brian, I, we could we could keep the convo going for for a long time, but I know we're uh, we're a little over time for this conversation. So I I very much appreciate you coming on to the podcast, and hope we can continue the conversation. Maybe uh, talk about other research down the road, or or what you're seeing in the industry. Absolutely, this is a blast. All right, man. Keep it real, Thank buddy. You, okay. Bye.